Welcome to the Modern Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my beautiful, amazing, skilled co-host and producer Jade Harrell. What's up, Jade? What's up, Sean? How are you doing today? Today, I am superstitive. Tell me about that. <laughs> I like it already. Yes, I am super appreciative of this moment mm. right now. Mm-hmm. 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 It's a special moment. It is. This is a big day for us mm-hmm. and a big day for everybody. This is our 100th episode yeah. of the Model Health Show. Wow. Right? Our a century. Centennial. <laughs> <laughs> so powerful. And I just, I really want to thank you, mm-hmm. you know, because this wouldn't be possible without you. And. It was a great day in my life when I met you. Man. That was a night, actually. Ladies' yeah. night of indulgence. Of indulgence. You know, it was. this particular event for um, our friends with uh, chiropractic, mm-hmm. Provision Chiropractic, invited me out to do the keynote. Yep. And you they were emceeing. out to be the emcee. And the, instantly. Yes. Worlds mm-hmm. collided, and it's helped to impact the lives of mm-hmm. thousands of people. And I just mm-hmm. want to thank you so much. Well, I give thanks for you. I did not expect you to say that just now. So. I'm going to keep my composure. I'm full of surprises. Yeah, constantly. (laughs) This podcast was a surprise, actually. So we need to talk. (laughs) But I'm so glad that you asked, and this has been right from the very beginning. There wouldn't be an opportunity for me to manifest my gift if it weren't for you. And I'm thankful for your presence in my life, for my family, for this world altogether. You are an amazing force, and I'm thankful to be in the flow. I receive all of that. Receive Thank it. you. <laughs> Thank yes. you, Jade. People well, today, need to practice just sharing love with one exactly. another. Exactly. I mean, you know, verbal love, at least. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put your hands on. Right, no. So that's really what today's show is about, and it's the driving force of this idea and this topic, which is how to fast track your results to have more success in your life. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we're in a really interesting and powerful place to speak on this topic. And it's, it's really because of this show really growing and, you know, having hundreds of thousands of downloads each month, which is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And also that being the catalyst for a best-selling book, which has been the catalyst for changing the lives of thousands of people. Right. And that's what it, it really boils down to. And so today the why is really to share some of the things or the shifts that I've had to make personally mm. to be able to help to bring this success to fruition. Yeah, we've had you to. You know, because yes, this is not for the weak hearted, <laughs> no. you know. But once, and it's again, it's about standing on the shoulders of giants. Once mm. you know these things, you don't have to go through it. Right. You know, or to that degree, you can just use these things and build on it yourself. And also to be able to share some of the things that I've learned from being able to work with and talk with some of the most successful people in the world. Yeah, that's been you great. know and to find out what they've done to achieve their success. And also one of the driving forces for today's topic is to share some of the things that I've helped my clients to succeed using over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, So this is like inside information here, and it's so powerful. This is probably going to be the most powerful episode that we've done thus far because it's the catalyst mm-hmm. for everything else. It's the catalyst for the decisions you make with, with at your dinner table. Right. It's the catalyst for deciding whether or not you're going to exercise. Mm-hmm. Or whether or not you're going to go to sleep or stay up and watch The Walking Dead, <laughs> right. you know, or whatever. Or be a Walking Dead. Exactly. <laughs> mm. I want to be a Walking Dead. Meet your brains. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get into this. And I'm really, really excited about this topic. And again, just want to thank you guys mm. for helping to make this possible. And also, I want to thank our show sponsor, Onnit.com, right. for helping to make this possible as well. They've been really great and helpful in, in us building. Mm-hmm. And... We're huge fans right. of their supplements, their exercise equipment. I use all their stuff. And you that know? stuff has helped us do yeah, well. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. using the stuff. And so I really am coming from a position of being skeptical on the pills and the powders, mm-hmm. you know. And what really excited me about them is, number one, earth-grown nutrients, you know, mm-hmm. food-based nutrition instead of isolated Synthetic chemicals made in a laboratory, right? Labor, you know, a laboratory, <laughs> you know, by just there's it's disconnected from nature, mm-hmm. you know. Whereas the premise behind on it is really about using those earth grown nutrients and coming up with formulas like our ancestors used mm-hmm. to do because things, even in isolation, don't necessarily work the best. They That's true. when they're combined with other things, it's called phytonutrient combining, mm-hmm. can make some real cool magic happen. Mm-hmm. So, number one, hemp force protein. That's the most bioavailable protein for the human body is going to be found in hemp. Edestin is this protein structure that is likely the most usable protein structure for you. 
And also it's a rich source of albumin, which is why people would um, basically suffer and eat some egg whites, (laughs) right? Why would you do that? Drink them raw. Uh, Because I'm trying to get this protein structure that's very digestible, which is albumin, Mm -hmm. which is also found in hemp. So you can actually enjoy the process of getting well and feeling good. What a concept. It's amazing. You know? <laughs> so definitely check out the Hemp Force Protein. It's amazing. It tastes incredible. Mm-hmm. And also I'm a huge fan of the Shroom Tech Sport. That's my pre-workout supplement based on Cordyceps Mushroom, which has over 5,000 years of documented history in Chinese medicine. But our modern me- medicine and, and scientific studies today are proving that this stuff actually does work. Mm-hmm. I just saw a recent study showing that it does, in fact, help to improve your insulin sensitivity, which... The other side of that is insulin resistance, which a classic sign of insulin resistance is carrying around a lot of belly fat. So this is something that could potentially help with that. But also it's helpful in oxygenating your blood, improving your circulation, which can also improve your libido. And Mm -hmm. there's so many other, because we don't want to focus on that. It's not like popping a Viagra where it's just like, what's up? (laughs) Boom. This is something that happens naturally over time, you know, so you can you know, throw up a tent whenever it's appropriate rather than in a, you know, in a moment you're taking a pill. And I don't want people to be focused on taking pills to treat a symptom rather than we want to take our supplements for the purpose of encouraging overall health. Absolutely. So head over on it.com forward slash model for 10% off all of your health and human performance supplements. Now let's get into the iTunes review of the week. Well, our 100th episode iTunes review is another five star review. Thank you all so much. This one is from Erin Elizabeth Werenberg. She says, you are my catalyst. Thank you so much, so much for Sean and Jade both being on this podcast and showing up so authentically, lovingly, and honestly. As a listener who was diagnosed and then reversed my hormone imbalance and PCOS naturally a few years ago, but needs to continuously choose positive, healthy habits and mindset to maintain my health, I turn to this show as my catalyst and my activation. When I listen to Sean and Jade and guests, I can feel the parts of my body that want to choose health and nourishment getting activated. This helps me as I navigate and turn down things in this world that are oversaturated with poison and decisions that only deplete my health. Thank you for strengthening my force field and my inner knowing. Thank you for helping me choose health. When I listen to this podcast, I feel I am having a conversation with my friends. The warm, intimate, humorous, and accessible environment created by Sean and Jade is so much appreciated and the main reason why I love this podcast so much. I find myself laughing and remaining light just as much as I am learning while listening and staying light through the change and self-discipline is so important. Thank you too, Jade, for always asking such thoughtful questions and challenging the assumptive mind I can fall into while listening. And thank you, Sean, for providing such a breadth and depth of content. Love, love, love to you both and this show so much. Thank you for everything. Light and love to you, XOXO Aaron. Wow, what a perfect review for this episode. Wow. Thank you, really. Thank you from my heart to yours and everybody who's left reviews for us yeah. and who we've uh, spoken to and through on all the previous episodes as well. I just want to thank you and acknowledge you. Um, and pr- I promise you, we are just going to get bigger and better. And we've got so many amazing shows coming up yeah. even this year. Mm-hmm. Just it's getting good. It's getting, it's a getting good. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get into the topic of the day. Today, we're talking about how to fast track your results and to have more success in your life. And that's really what you signed up for when you made your appearance on this planet, was to be successful, mm-hmm. you know, at being you. And that's what we're really going to talk about and how to have more success, more happiness, more health, more abundance in your life. And this really begins with the premise and underlying understanding that most people are playing the supporting role in their own lives and they don't even know it. <laughs> that's a great analogy. You know? When we're born, we're entrusted with the dual responsibility of being the lead actor and the director of our own movie, our Mm. own life. But over time, for whatever reason, due to societal conditioning, due to our circumstance, our conditions, we often pass off that directorial role onto other people, onto the world around us, and also pass off on the opportunity to be the real star in our own movie, Mm -hmm. which is what you're born to be. And so 
the key word here is that it's allowing. We allow it to happen. Okay. Right. So whether you understand this consciously or unconsciously, when you are allowing someone to dictate what you do with your life, you're giving them silent permission to do so. Right. Right. You're giving them silent permission to do so. Mm. And this really today is your opportunity to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so this leads us into what I'm going to share today, which is four critical steps to taking back control of your life and becoming the star that you were born to be. Mm -hmm. All right. So number one, hey, bu buckle in, buckle in, mm -hmm. because this is really powerful and important. Number one is to uncover where you've been placing blame. <sighs> blame is one of the most disempowering actions that you can take in this world. When you blame others or any negative circumstance that you find yourself in, you are giving complete control to them mm -hmm. and you're disabling your ability to change it. You know, and this is, is really an important, powerful insight. And so some people might be like, well, you don't understand. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that what happened in your life doesn't matter, that it's not valid. Right. You are valid. It is definitely valid. Now, some people might be hearing this and thinking that, you know, this is negating the fact that something negative might have happened to them. Right. This isn't the fact that what happened to you doesn't matter or that it's not valid. It's absolutely valid. You are valid. It's just understanding that you don't want to live there. Mm -hmm. You don't want to live there because until you take responsibility, you will be stuck. Right. And you'll keep hitting a glass ceiling. You know, you're, you're trying to rise up, but you don't know what's stopping you. Mm -hmm. And it's because you've placed blame and you're not taking responsibility. And once you do that, you're able to... To change things. If you're expecting someone else who you're blaming to change, it's going to be a long, arduous wait, wait, most likely. Well, you'll reside there for a long period of time. And you mentioned about the things that matter in your life and the things that happen to you matter. Yes, they do. But if you eliminate yourself, then you diminish the validity of yourself in it. Mm -hmm. So all these things are going on without you, minus you, eliminating you. Yes. And there's no way that you can engage it yes if you're and not present when you take responsibility you're giving yourself the opportunity to move past it mm -hmm. and that's really where the power is john burroughs said a man can fail many times but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else mm. okay now people blame <laughs> this is some real talk here okay. people blame people other people like they're getting paid for it <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. they problem. did this to me <laughs> right they said this, mm -hmm. they said that. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. No, mm -hmm. I don't understand. I don't understand from your unique perspective, but I do understand similar circumstances. You know, I've been abused. I've been hurt. I've been beaten. I've been kicked out of school and blocked from having opportunities. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, in situations where I've lost loved ones to suicide and to murder. I've been hurt. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what I know for sure is that it's up to me to change it mm -hmm. and my response in the world. And it's up to you to do the same thing in your life. Right. So I'm going to share this one story with you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you back. And one of the stories that could have blocked me from being here today. Okay. And so we're going to go back in time. <laughs> this is like the Lil Wayne's right. world scene comes in. <laughs> we so we're going to go back circles. in time <laughs> <laughs> to high school. And so I'm 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm a junior in high school. And you look exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, um, I'm, quote, scholar athlete uh, on student advisory, student government. I'm in a, pro a program called Inroads, mm -hmm. which was in conjunction with a university. So being able to take university courses in high school. Uh, quote, teenage health consultant, oh which I had no idea that I wanted to do anything with health. I just wanted to get out of class. <laughs> All right. And so I've got all these, and I, I think I had like maybe around a 3.8 GPA. Not bad. Okay. And this is while playing football mm -hmm. at a high level and practicing more than what was required of me. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot going for me. Right. And I was in a situation where towards the end of um, the football season, I started to really have this interaction with this kid, you know, and he was seen as like the scary dude in school and and please understand this isn't like a movie this is like we're talking about situations where people can kill people mm -hmm. you know very easily like we grew up in in conditions where time, yeah. you know i grew up around a lot of violence and one story's coming to mind right now uh when i was 
maybe 12 years old, just going to a corner store. You know, I lived on the south side, St. Louis, and it wasn't that friendly then. I come out of the corner <laughs> store, got my $1, yeah. 100 pieces of candy. There you go. Right? Uh, got my little bag of candy. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how I survived. I step out of the door, and there's a gun in my face. A kid smaller than me, he had to be 10, and saying, take my shoes off. Right? And luckily, you know, the store owner came out, he ran away. But just seeing stuff like that on a pretty consistent basis, and also in my family circumstances, um, just dealing with a lot of violence. And we were also taught to fight. You know, that's how we resolve things. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in high school, I really got my act together because I had got suspended from middle school like five times for fighting. Mm -hmm. And this is, and and again, please understand, I'm not trying to play a victim role here. I still participated, even though I'm not the guy ever to want to go and hurt somebody, or why would I pick a fight with somebody? So I had this story of I needed to prove myself and defend myself, but there are better ways of doing that. And so I thought I'd moved past that. Mm-hmm. So in high school, everything is going well, but this kid just kept on, you know, really getting to me, you know, calling me out of my name, even, you know, bumping oh, into me, allowed, putting his hands on me. Allowed him to get to you. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it got to the point where after the football season Wait, was over. Wait, he put his hands on you? I mean, just bumping into me, oh. that kind of thing, you know. And I know that this is also, of course, and I was raised like, you don't let nobody do I that. Know. And so after the football season was over, um, I was walking with my friend and my friend stopped to talk to one of his friends. And so I'm standing there right in front of him and I just turned around. So he hopefully didn't say anything. And he said something of the nature of like, you know, look at this pretty boy, uh, some, some stuff. And I just, I turned around and I hit him. Mm-hmm. And I hit him hard. I hit him with like a year of wanting to hit him. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, he was essentially kind of knocked out. And so his other friends that were there started trying to fight me. And so it was just kind of like this matrix scene, right? And maybe a couple minutes go by, some teachers come in, uh, a teacher end up getting hurt. Because again, we're we're bigger kids now. You know, it's like we're we're actually young adults. Mm -hmm. And so this is pretty serious. And I had all this blood all over me from from him. And so it's just like, I was kind of in this shock, shock state. And after it's over, it's just like, okay, you know, I'm gonna get suspended for 10 days, so be it. And what ended up happening was, I ended up getting expelled oh, from school God. for the rest of the year. Whoa. And because I had already started that semester, I'd gotten straight Fs. So at this point, it didn't matter how good of a person I was or how much I had accomplished, I made a decision You know, because at the end of the day, the other situations and what it was, honestly, and, you know, I've never really talked about this publicly before because it's something that, you know, I can't even see that as being I'm I'm the same person. Mm -hmm. But it was this concept before it was self-defense. This time I threw the punch. I threw the punch. And I was blaming him for making me do it, Mm -hmm. you know, and... This is not even the big part of the story. The big part of the story is I had one opportunity to stand in front of the Board of Education in the school district that I was in, uh, which is Chesterfield or Rockwood School District here in St. Louis. And I was in something called the desegregation program, Mm -hmm. right? Listen, how do we even have words like that today in association with school? Uh And so I'm being bussed out from the inner city to, you know, quote, good school in a good neighborhood. And so it really, for me, it just didn't seem like it mattered. I mattered because I had all this good stuff. Look at all these things that I've done and how much value I'm bringing to your school. How are you just going to expel me from the school Mm -hmm. and not allow me to come back? You know, and so I I had this separation in my mind that it's their fault. They won't let me back in. Mm -hmm. And I had all these faces that were different than mine sitting in this room. And I seemed I felt so small. I felt like this little this little baby, a little ant. And there are these like giants all around me, mm-hmm. you know, women and men's faces that were different from, them, from mine right. who held my fate in their hands. Mm-hmm. And so I stuck to that story for a couple of weeks. But then something happened. And this is just a preview of what was to happen later, but just remembering the value that I have, you know, and the potential because of the other people around me also helping to affirm that. For instance, my grandmother, she was not having that, that I was not going to finish high school, Mm -hmm. right? I was expected to go far beyond that. And so at that moment, I decided I'm going to do whatever it takes and I'm still going to graduate with my class, even though I'm missing an entire year of school. So I graduated in three years of high school. I took correspondence courses. 
I took classes before class. It was called Zero Hour, right? Mm -hmm. And I worked my behind off right. to graduate with my class. And I stood there two years later and graduated yeah. with my class. That's all right. That's and all right. so the sto it's because the story changed for me. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you know, every step along the way, there were, there were places that I could place blame. You know, well, now I'm not going to be able to get into the school I want. Every school that I applied to, I got it. Mm -hmm. so I got, I got it accepted. Right. And it was because I went the extra step. And this is what I want to encourage people to do. If you really want something, just like you want to go get that new pair of shoes or that new car, if you really want to achieve success, you can do it, but you have to have that fire, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, I did whatever it took. So I was going to the different teachers. I even got a letter of recommendation for one of the guys, one of the teachers who got hurt wow. breaking up that fight. Wow. So you know? that's where your good came back. So in that moment, you felt like, well, what about all the good things I've been doing? See, it's yeah. never wasted is the thing we also miss. Well, what happened to, I mean, I've been great all the way up in here. What happens to that? It doesn't ever die. And it doesn't ever diminish. In that moment, maybe it's not seen or, or realized, but it still played a key role. That teacher was not able to assess you in that one moment, the one that got hurt. Yeah. That teacher probably knew. This kid. He was a fan. He was a, he was a fan of my athletic performance. And he was just kind of shocked that any of that stuff went on. See what I mean? And this is the thing. We also, we don't know about the stories, the internal struggles that are going on with the other people that we might be blaming. Sure. You know? And here's a really powerful story. It was about maybe five or six years ago, the the young the young man that I fought who, like, to me, he was, he, I was immensely scared of this, of this kid, mm -hmm. right? And he was coming to school, like, you know, his grades were, he was failing. You know, he was coming to the school for the purpose of just, like, he had to. Mm -hmm. And then like messing with me, you know, and he sent me a message on Facebook, which is the power of social media. And I was just, you know, I accepted his friend request. I was actually at an event in California at the time. I was like, wow, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. I mean, I haven't heard from him since our parents got us together and had a meeting. It was at a Burger King <laughs> <laughs> to just kind of settle this. And I remember his mom seeing me. Parents. Yeah. And his mom, his mother seeing me and just like, he did this to you? You know, because her son was just this really kind of just um, menacing character, mm -hmm. you know, Seemingly and I'm just powerful. On yes. The outside, yes. But as you hear the rest of his story, he was disempowered. And so he sent me the mess, a message after I accepted his friend request. And he said, you know, hey, how you doing? I just wanted to let you know that I. I deserved what I got. And like, I could not believe that he said those words. And now I, I also want to parallel with that, that nobody deserves to be hurt like that, mm -hmm. you know, and but it just shocked me because it wasn't for in his story. This was a catalyst for him transforming his life to where mm -hmm. he's started. I, be, I believe he started a nonprofit organization or he runs one or he works for one. Look at that. And he went to college. Wow. He did really well. And it changed the course of his life as mm -hmm. well. So it's like two success stories yeah. came from this one turmoil. Punch. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but it had the, the shift had to happen. You talk about how we collided, our worlds collided. Yeah. Your worlds were colliding for a greater purpose. And he also got that same, I'm going to own this. Yeah. That had to happen on both sides for that trajectory to change. Yes. That's amazing. So I just want to share that this could have been a, one of the points that I threw in the towel many yeah. times along that journey. But I had it so fixed in my mind that I was going to achieve and nothing was going to stop me. Mm -hmm. I had every reason in the world to quit. I could have. So there was a shift, though. Sean, you said you got on fire and you started yes. doing, and you you were determined because you were pretty determined going going into this. Yeah. Where did you come out of the dark into that place and return to knowing? I want to know what shifted. I'm, I'm going to share with you kind of some of the things. Oh, did I steal that? No, it's okay. <laughs> this, is, this is what we do. We're like this. Is this. so exciting. So... <laughs> Number one, so what does taking responsibility do? All right, because I was putting the responsibility off on the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. I was putting the responsibility off on this other young man. I was putting the responsibility off on my parents. You could have rode that train for a while. Exactly. Forever. And and nobody really would have, you know, thought anything of it, you know, because mm -hmm. it's true. Something really bad did happen. But what does taking responsibility do? Number one, it puts the power back in your hands. Mm -hmm. So once I took responsibility, now I had the ability to change, mm -hmm. to change myself, not the other person, to change myself. What gave you the permission to get off of that ride? It's just, it's really just a matter of 
honestly, again, taking responsibility. It's really that simple. Mm-hmm. The responsibility, let's break you it down. You have to say, okay, I'm going to take it, though. See, there's a piece missing. I'm going to take it and taking it. There's two steps. It's really, here's, here's what it is. Very simple. What's done is done. Okay. You know, what's done is done. That's the, I can't change that. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, it's that kind of universal law of accepting what is. Yeah. You know, and now what can you do? Mm-hmm. And so coming from that place, so number one is to put, it puts the power back in your hands. So this is what taking responsibility does. Number two, it allows you to make adjustments in your approach instead of waiting for others to make the changes you want. Mm-hmm. All right. Because a lot of us are unhappy because we're waiting on other people in our lives to change. Right. All right. Mm-hmm. This is very disempowering. Also, what taking responsibility does, it really, it's about change. Again, it's, it's about changing yourself, not the other person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because that's virtually impossible because... Every single human being, whether they understand it or not, or you understand it or not, is their own sovereign, govern, entity, uh, regulator of the, everything going on with them. They have to choose to be influenced by you or not. Period. You know. So if you're working your, you're spending your time trying to change other people, it's really a waste, wasted life of your human experience. Mm-hmm. Focus on changing you, because the funny thing is, when you change, the world around you starts mm-hmm. to change as well, mm-hmm. and kind of starts to vibrate at that same frequency. So the change was in the choice. The change was in the choosing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so also it opens up the doors of possibility. This is what's so powerful, guys. So another thing that taking responsibility does is it opens up the doors of possibility. Mm -hmm. You literally begin to see differently when this happens. And you begin to ask things like, what are ways to make this happen? What are ways to make this happen? What are ways to make this happen with my health? What are ways to make this happen so that I can graduate with my class? What are ways to make this happen so that I can go to the college that I want to? Right. Instead of, why won't this happen? Mm-hmm. Why? Why me? Mm-hmm. Why did this happen to me? Mm-hmm. And the human brain is really wired up to answer questions. So anything that you ask, it's going to search for things to affirm that. Yes. The number one driving force of a human being is to stay congruent with the ideas that they carry of themselves. So if you're carrying around ideas that you don't have, why me, why this, why that, you're going to find a lot of things to affirm how crappy your situation is, yeah. right? So it's asking questions like, what are ways to make this happen? Start to birth themselves because you start to see the possibilities where there were, there were no possibilities. There were none. Right. I'm kicked out of school. Mm-hmm. That's not the end of the story. Yeah. You know, but it could have been. But until I take responsibility, I start to see, well, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always a way. Yeah. And those questions, what I hear is they act like a, kind of a gateway to the responses. So what can I do to make this happen? Opened up a whole, I guess, um, environment of responses to that. Yeah. But the whys or why nots and I don'ts, well, here's that door mm-hmm. because of this and this and this and this. And there's you can get lost in that whole maze mm-hmm. because those aren't those aren't affirming and and life opening types of options. So you can get in that door and get all entangled. Yeah. But with the, how can I make this useful? How do I benefit from this? What are ways that I can eliminate these, these obstacles? Then there are all, cause well, here's one, mm-hmm. maybe this one. Yeah. And here's, those are all things that allow you to press forward as opposed to get yeah. hung up. And that's what happens if, again, if you take responsibility for the situation you're in, you can see those things. Mm-hmm. But if you're placing blame, so let's just face it. Ultimately, resentment and blame is toxic. Mm-hmm. It doesn't serve you in your mission. And what we want to do is to just start to have standards. You know, of course, it's not about being honest about the things that have happened to you, but it's having standards so that these things no longer happen mm-hmm. to you, right? And how can you serve afterwards? Because again, Resentment and blame is toxic. Yeah. Nelson Mandela said this. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. How about that? And who better would understand that and who than him? It's just ultimately understanding who is this hurting, what you're carrying around, this blame, this resentment. It's hurting you, mm-hmm. not the other person. And once you understand that I have responsibility, I know what happened to me. I know I've got this story. But now things are going to change. Sure. I take responsibility for my response. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's response, responsibility. Able. It's responsibility. I'm able to yes. Respond to this how I choose. There you go. Mm. That's what it is. I can own this, whether or not I can explain it, whether or not I understand how it all came to pass. When you said Nelson Mandela, I was thinking, well, how does he take responsibility? He chooses how he responds. He's able to respond 
how he desires. Yes. To quote the immortal words of the 69 boys. Oh, gosh. Whoop, there it is. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So that's number one. Number one is to uncover where you've been placing blame. I this, need help getting that out my This mind. is going to bring you to another level of success yeah. in and of itself. And if you're going to achieve the success and the health and the vitality and the abundance that you want in your life, number one mm-hmm. is to uncover where you've been placing blame. Number two is to put your biggest excuses off the movie lot. All right? <laughs> so we're talking about this story of you being a supporting actor in your own movie. Mm-hmm. All right. We got to put the excuses off the movie lot. Get security, right? right? Get Paul, <laughs> like Paul Blart, there we go. whatever. Uh-huh. So here's some of the typical excuses. Uh-oh. I don't have time. Oh, God. I don't have the money. I don't have the connections. I don't have the advantages. I don't have the experience. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. That may be true. There's always an excuse as to why you can't have what you really want. But the mm-hmm. truth is they are just that. Excuses. They're excuses. Mm-hmm. And Sure, your challenges may be valid again, but there is a way. Mm-hmm. So let me share with you guys the story of uh, a gentleman named John Paul DeJoria. Okay, uh-huh. John Paul DeJoria. Very good name. Yeah, it is. So this is a, he was a little boy who grew up in East Los Angeles in pretty tough surroundings, which I can definitely identify with. Right. And his father left at the age of two. And he was in a situation where his mother had to take care of him and his brother, and it was a, in this particular situation, he actually had to stay in a foster home through the week and he could only see his mother on the weekends. And they got by. Now, he showed early entrepreneurial signs. All right. At the age of nine, he sold Christmas cards door to door for some pocket change. Nice. All right. But by the age of 10, he and his brother had started up their own paper routes selling the L.A. Examiner. And even at this early age, he was disciplined enough to get up at four o'clock in the morning to do his paper route. And have enough time to get ready for school. All right, now. Now, when he got of age, he joined the Navy. And he had um, prophesied or he wanted to go to dental school. (laughs) But when he got out of the Navy, he couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And shortly after, um, he had a a wife. He he got married. And it was a very brief marriage that ended. And this was shortly after him getting out of the Navy. And she actually left him with his two-year-old son. History repeating itself. Yeah. Two years old. Right. Right. But he's playing a different character in this movie. Mm -hmm. That's another important thing for people to take away is that history will repeat itself unless you interrupt the pattern. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Which he did a incredible pattern interrupt, which we're going to talk about here. So he found himself actually homeless at this point. And he was living with his son in his car and collecting soda bottles in order to get a few dollars just to get by. Now we're going to fast forward a little bit. He had all manner of odd jobs, and this was the early 1970s, and he landed a job with Redken Laboratories, which is where he actually got his first taste of the hair care product industry, all right? Now, he left because he believed he could make a comparable product line, but out of natural ingredients, and he actually went all in on his vision and found himself homeless again, all right? Just just hold on. He found himself homeless again, but working along with his partner, Paul Mitchell, to get their company off the ground. They had $700 between them, Mm. all right? They started Paul Mitchell Systems and spent the next year going door to door doing live product demonstrations at local salons. Now, as they would make more money, they'd invest it back in and they traveled across the country doing these live demonstrations. Now, he did confess that there were a lot of tough times during this and they actually almost filed for bankruptcy many times, but they didn't give up. They worked diligently and the work really actually paid off. Uh, and the rest yes. is, as you'll say, is history. Now, mm-hmm. Paul Systems, Paul Mitchell Systems today has over 90 products and are sold internationally in over 80 countries and boasts annual sales in excess of $1 billion. John Paul DeJoria went on to start many successful companies, but one of the most popular being Patron Tequila, right? <laughs> now, today, Paul is worth over $3 billion. That's billion with a B. Mm. Three billion dollars. And he could have had all the excuses in the world not to succeed. Mm-hmm. Right. Homeless twice. Twice. Right. Father left. Right. Two years old. Wife left him with his two year old kid. Mm-hmm. And he's from a poor neighborhood. Uh, foster care. No connections. This could be a mile long of reasons why not mm-hmm. of excuses. Mm-hmm. Or, or of those I don't have. 
but he didn't make excuses. He just found a way to make it happen. He kept moving forward. And that's really what I want to implore you to do today is to keep moving forward. Despite the conditions, despite the things that have happened to you, this can be a great part of your story. Your story is so good. (laughs) It's so good. You're just in the earlier chapters, Mm -hmm. you know, but you're the hero in the story and you can change things and make amazing things happen. So, and really what I, the kind of point that I want to get across with this is that there's something interesting about the universe and it appears to respond in like kind to the dominant thoughts you carry in your mind. Yeah. And uh, please understand when I talk about this, this universe is beyond comprehension and I've studied you know, individuals like Albert Einstein, Mm -hmm. you know, down to like his story and other individuals who won Nobel Prizes like Max Planck, for example, um, physicists and looking at quant, he actually originated quantum theory, Mm -hmm. right? Now, there are laws that govern everything. And if you learn to make these laws work for you, then you can be essentially liberated on this planet while you're here. Now, one law is that your outer world is a direct reflection of your inner world. So if you're ripe with excuses, always going on about what you do not have, the universe will respond in like kind. Yeah. You're like, I don't have it. I don't have it. The universe is like, I don't need to deliver. You don't have it. Right. No, you don't have it. <laughs> there you go. And again, so the Matrix is that, that the movie franchise, huge, changed the game in film. Loved it. This was really brought from a term that was created by Max, Max Planck, who actually won a Nobel Prize when Einstein was doing his thing. He kind of beat him out for it, <laughs> all right? And he called it the divine matrix. It's enabling you to see what you're seeing because there's so much more there. And uh, researchers do understand now that we only get a small fraction of conscious data from all that we're absorbing and picking up. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a hundredth of a fraction of a percent. Everything else is being absorbed subconsciously and unconsciously because it would drive you crazy if you picked everything up which you are picking up but not consciously for example your toes mm-hmm. right and now everybody just thought about their toes I did. but were your toes not there before they you were. know was your energy not there was circulation not happening were they not alive they were but your conscious attention wasn't there because it's too much data at one mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. so you're going to be picking up what's most persistent in your own thinking mm-hmm. from the environment around you And so essentially when you're saying to the universe, I don't have it, I don't have it, I don't have it, the universe is answering in like kind, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. You don't have it. And so it is. And your consciousness goes there too. Just like you did with our toes. If I'm saying I don't have it, I'm speaking that and there goes my toe. And you again. I'm not going to find it. You guys know (laughs) I'm a very analytical person. Mm -hmm. And even though some of this, quote, airy stuff is very powerful and very, I've seen it work tangible things in my life. We still can't explain it. And I'm, I'm looking for the science to understand this more. And this really got me into looking at uh, physicist Max Planck, who won the Nobel prize when Einstein was doing his thing, which he won one too, you know, but he called this the matrix. Mm -hmm. And this was really the, the underlying premise for the movie series, which has become incredibly popular and really changed the game in filmmaking. Um, But, the, the matrix, this mind, this kind of intelligence behind everything. And so Max Planck actually re, uh, originated quantum theory. So what we're talking about today in science, quantum yeah. mechanics, yeah. right? Quantum physics. Mm-hmm. He's the originator of these concepts. And he won the Nobel Prize, and this was in 1918. And so also the research from like uh, Stephen Hawking, for example, who's there's just been a major movie made um, in honor of him as well. Just brilliant thinker and understanding like, there's this underlying fabric that is governing the things around us and it's based on what you are feeling. Yeah. It's based on your intention. It's based on your thoughts. You're actually changing the world around you. And so I'm going to share one little quick, tiny study. Uh, physicist Vladimir uh, Popenine, and he proved that human DNA actually affects the most minute particles in the universe, which are known as photons, which they did the study where they used, it was a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And they knew that there was nothing inside this vacuum except these tiny particles of photons because they're just everywhere. And they put DNA into the vacuum, okay? Because first, when they looked at the vacuum without anything in it, the particles are just scattered randomly. As soon as they put uh, the human DNA in there, the, the photons immediately attached themselves and encoded and surrounded the human DNA. Whoa. So that's the first part. That's Second part is... Exciting. Now, here's what's crazy. Second part is they take the DNA out 
of the vacuum, this, the, the, the particles still stayed in place. The photons stayed there as if the human DNA was still there. It made an imprint. It, it, made, an imprint. it made something permanent, mm -hmm. right? Because of this human DNA. And so then there's other studies showing that literally your thoughts and the, even the energy around you can change what your DNA is doing. Thoughts of stress, uh, hatred, anger, literally makes your DNA constrict and get tighter, mm -hmm. right? And start to, essentially, you can start to print out, uh, we'll just say less sexy copies of yourself, <laughs> right? So, and this is based on what's going on with your emotions and with your feelings. And also, again, the world around you is affecting your what's going on with your body as well. Right. You know, we're, we're not all powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, we're extremely powerful. We're connected to that. Right. But we're also, we're, we're a part of the same body in another sense as well. Mm -hmm. So you have the utmost responsibility of being the leading actor and director in your own movie. Right. But please understand, there are other characters in your oh, film. Oh, there's improv artists everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't let them steal the show. So when we talked about this uh, research out of HeartMath Institute showing mm -hmm. that there is a, um, a field of... of bioelectrical or uh, electromagnetic energy that, res that uh, emanates from the human body. Mm -hmm. It's about eight feet from your body. That's okay? right. And everybody has that going on. So we're interacting with each other yeah. whenever you're in the presence of other individuals. Well, and this is why you can study. quote, pick up somebody's vibes, right. you know, <laughs> or that person, I don't know, or I really love being around that person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just that there's this separate entity. You guys are creating or interacting with these energetic fields. This stuff is so powerful. And of it course, is. we're going to do shows dedicated talking specifically to this. But I just wanted to touch on these things and understand that you want to expel the excuses from your life. And the only diet that I really advocate is an excuse free diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on an excuse free <laughs> diet. Give yourself this challenge. Just let's, let's run that. Run the challenge for they say 21 days to create a habit. Do three weeks, 21 days of an excuse free diet. Every time you start to catch yourself making an excuse about something, right. check yourself. Right. All right. And be accountable, you know, if it's something that, you know, maybe you didn't show up for or something that happened to you, check yourself and understand, wait, wait a minute, this is, a, this is an excuse, mm -hmm. I, there is another way, Right. all right? So put yourself on an excuse-free diet yes. for the next three weeks and just take that challenge or maybe just a day. For some people, right. it's like, <laughs> just a day, it's good. And just have that experience and find out all the things that you could be having access to that you're not giving yourself that capacity because you're making excuses. Sure. All right. Sure. And then increase your intake of response ability. All right. So just to recap. So the four critical steps to taking back control of your life and becoming the star that you were born to be. Number one is to uncover where you've been placing blame. Number two is to put your biggest excuses off the movie lot. <laughs> Get Paul Blart, mall security. And let's go on to number three, which is gain confidence by building experience. So the premise of this is. Nobody starts off being great at anything, right? This is just how it is. Nobody starts off being great at anything. And so for a lot of people, that could be discouraging. And, but for some other people, it can be extremely motivating. And it's just like, where do you lie on that spectrum? You get better by practice. Sure. You get better by practice. You get better by perseverance. You become great by learning from it all and sharing it with other people. And if you want to live a great life, that's where the magic really happens, yeah, you know. And so for me as an individual, just kind of share uh, another little story is. Um, so now I've had the opportunity to speak in front of hundreds of people in the audience and even thousands of people. So how many people were there? Like 7,000 at that. Um, oh, my goodness. Sister yes, yes, event. Yes, yeah. yes, the breast cancer walk. And it's just like it can mm -hmm. be two. It can could have just as easily been two people there. Mm -hmm. It affects me on the same kind of scale. Right. When I did my first talk, you know, all those years back, there were three people in my little audience in my mother-in-law's kitchen, and I was scared to death. I was so scared. <laughs> I was terrified. And I even knew them. Right. I knew who they were. Mm -hmm. but, but you had opened up a place in yes. you that was very vulnerable. Yes. <laughs> you know, all eyes on me, yeah. you know. And what made me nervous uh, partially was, like, I wanted, to, I wanted to give them the gift that I had. You know, and I was I was worried about it. Like, am I going to communicate this right? Mm -hmm. And so that 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 right there in of itself was a valuable lesson I want to share with everybody, which is what got me past that for many, many years and events after that is I took the focus off myself. I was worried about myself mm -hmm. doing a good job mm -hmm. instead of being focused on them. Right. So I shifted the focus 
to the audience. I shifted the focus to the people who were there, the attendees, so that they can be happy. You know, I just shift the focus on service. Whatever I got to do to make you feel good and to feel empowered in this moment, that's what I'm going to do. That's right. And that's just a powerful shift you can use anywhere in your life. Absolutely. You know? I made that my closing signature on my email and other correspondence is success and service. It's always success and service. And the success comes through the service. It's what I live by. So and you're amazing, by the way. <laughs> and so if you're I'm just your reflection. If you're a coach, it's about logging those sessions. If you're a speaker, it's getting those presentations in. If you're a chef, it's about getting those desserts done That's right. or whatever the case might be. Um, but, you know, you can become great by doing the thing, learning from your mistakes and also emphasizing your strengths and sharing it with others. Mm -hmm. And this is what I've seen across the board. Of course, there are exceptions to all of this stuff. But from the majority of successful people that I've spoken with, they've really been focusing on their strengths and emphasizing that and sharing that with other people. Of course, you do want to share up your weaknesses a little bit. Of course. But it's really about what are you good at? Mm -hmm. um, I have a story to share. Bring it on. <laughs> so I had a high school radio show. And uh, it was for the lunch hour of my peers. And as creative as I was and as much as I enjoyed music, I despised, was self-conscious, and did not feel confident enough to speak. Mm. So I had the ability, but I was not confident within myself to speak. I could host a great show um, and have folks dancing during lunch, but I wouldn't talk. And my DJ name was DJ Ability. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I love that. Because I use that as an excuse that my mixes and mm. that my talent speaks for itself. Mm. And that carried on through high school, college, and thereafter in which I didn't even focus on my passion for creating and putting together a harmonious presentation, which is now my work as a producer. But I pursued a business degree and I put it aside and set it on the back burner and even coming out, being around tremendous talent, I would measure what they did mm -hmm. and say, well, I'm not as good as they are. You know, the the some that are running record labels now mm -hmm. and doing tremendous work, I always would talk myself out of opening up fully. So I was petrified when it came to my first on-air presentation that didn't require turntables or music. Uh, and this is well after getting a business degree and all that. And I actually had to speak. And I felt this mm -hmm. <laughs> this tightening of my throat. I almost thought I couldn't breathe. And um, it took getting out of the myself part and putting up a picture of my favorite comedian at the time that I had worked with. His name was Earthquake. We worked at a comedy club and he used to tease me real bad. But he would always bring a great smile. So I focused on that picture and then night after night, and this is midnight to 6 a.m., the graveyard shift as a beginner on commercial radio, it started to get better. And then I started to give people the heart of me that didn't sound like what I had heard before on the air anywhere else. Um, the sincerity, the, the service, the caring to say, hey, I encourage you, I believe in you, and not even knowing who that would touch. And then I started getting feedback. Mm -hmm. Hey, we appreciate what you said. And... I was listening the other day and I was really glad to hear and started really thinking how valuable positivity is Yeah, and being able to share it in that way. So it came full circle. So for producers and for artists and for presenters, keep speaking, keep pouring your heart out through your words and your gift. Absolutely. That's so <laughs> awesome. And really just grow yourself, mm -hmm. like focus on growing yourself, because, again, nobody starts off being great at anything. Right. They might be all right. <laughs> he might be all right. Oh, he's got some natural yeah, he's talent. Got some but he's got a lot of holes. That's you know, right. there's going to be a lot of gaps there. You're not great. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody starts off that way. So grow yourself. And sure, you've got to actually, you've got to get out there and make things happen. Yeah. You know, you've got to get out there and experiment, try, because that experience is going to build the confidence. It does. You know, because now, like, you run this stuff and, like, you could literally do it in your sleep. I could. You know? I do sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes, you know, it's um, it's just understanding, like, there was a time when all of this was, you know, you're wide eyed and I like everything. Yeah. You, you didn't want to mess anything up. Right. Which is a different perspective than like, I, I got this with a healthy confidence. And to wrap this whole point up is is just a simple law is that 
Success is really a result of the person you become. You attract success into your life by the person you become. Mm -hmm. It's not something you get out there and you go and chase it down and you make it happen. It's really about growing yourself and growing in experiences because even the most negative experiences help to create a texture of your story that can resonate with people at a deeper level sure. that you don't even know about yet until you get out there and you and you share mm -hmm. and you work on your craft and you and you take action to do the thing that you are, are here to do, right. you know? And so for the people also that are like, well, I don't know what I'm here to do. Right. I'm going to put uh, a post, uh, a link at, for this episode. And so go to themodelhealthshow.com forward slash 100 in the show notes. And there's going to be an episode there. And I'll point it out. I'll bold it. Um, or I'm sorry, a resource there for you to kind of help you to figure out what your mission or your purpose is. Mm -hmm. All right. So but this show is not about that. And hopefully even the stuff we've talked about is helping to kind of flesh that out. And for you to start to be honest with yourself about like, what do you really want? What do you really want to do? What have you told yourself that you can't do because of the outside circumstances, right? right? So we're stepping into the starring role today. Mm -hmm. And this is a real good first step. So let's recap. <laughs> Number one is to uncover where you've been placing blame. Number two is to put your big excuses off the movie lot. Number three is to gain confidence by building experience. And number four, and the final one, is to know your worth. Yes. To finally step into that leading role in your life, you have to know your worth. You have to know how valuable you are. Yes. Oscar-winning hip-hop artist Common said this powerful line in his song. He said, nobody believes until I believe me. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes until I believe me. This is years before the Oscar, <laughs> right? Right. And he was speaking into existence that I have to believe in myself first before anybody else will. That's right. And I, and I told a story earlier of uh, Mr. DeJoria, yeah. right? And he had this really interesting confidence about him, even when he was homeless, right? He didn't have it. He had $700. But he's like, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to find a way to make this work. I believe in me. I believe in this mission. And billions of dollars later, you know, mm -hmm. he made it happen. And it's not that, again, that he has to be the exception, right? It's just where are you at mentally? Yeah. Now, believing yourself is actually often easier said than done, yeah. for sure, because the reality for most of us is that our con conditions can actually seemingly knock that self-confidence and value right out of us. And we have some really twisted up taboos in our culture that actually dissuade us in a way from acknowledging that we're even important. Yeah. that we're beautiful, that we have value. And most often it's because, well, part of the reason is the people who break that line, they go too far to the other direction uh, into a place of superiority, really, which is, you know, look how great I am. Look at how my butt looks compared to, <laughs> to her, you know. Uh, don't, talk to, don't talk to me. <laughs> In your head, at least, don't talk to me. You're beneath me. Yeah. Don't talk to me. Just because you have a bigger butt than somebody... <laughs> doesn't mean that you're more valuable to you know? everybody. But, but this is where that line gets broken and people is like, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to acknowledge that I do have a nice butt <laughs> because I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to acknowledge that I'm talented because I don't want to be like that person. Right. And so because there's a difference between a healthy self-confidence and knowing your value and just being like a dominant narcissistic human being mm -hmm. where you're better than everyone, you know, which there's no such thing. Right. You know, there's no such thing. And I think it's this concept of superiority and the religiosity that surrounds it that makes people shy away from a healthy self-appreciation of their divinity. Mm. And you are unique. You are valuable. You are brilliant. You are special. And I really want you to know that. I want you to hear that. Yeah. You know, you are brilliant. Please, please hear me. You are brilliant. It's not, it's not how smart are you. It's how are you smart, okay? There are certain things that you're naturally gifted in. You naturally have capacities and, 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 and talents. It doesn't mean you're great, but you, you have things that are really highly acclimated to you and you your unique, unique presence, right? There has never been another person like you to exist on the face of this planet and there never will be. That's right. You have this amazing chance right here before you to do something special with that because that's why you showed up, yeah. right? And so with your value, it's really now is a step of finding a way to share it. It's not about, look how much better I am at this than you are. It's packaging it up in a way that 
I have these gifts, finding a way to share it and to serve with it so that everyone else is benefited from your gifts. And again, it's not about how smart you are, it's how are you smart, all right? Because IQs don't tell the whole story, uh, grades don't tell the whole story. There are things that you know somebody might be led to believe that they're just not valuable because they're not good in math, but maybe they're a brilliant musician or they're, um, they're, they're exceptional at writing and telling stories. You know, that's what it really boils down to is how are you smart? And finding, finding that out, acknowledging that, because chances are it's likely there. And a big kind of barrier to that is that stuff that's easy for us, we don't see it, mm-hmm. you know, because we're immersed in it. Yeah. You might be really great at managing people. You might be really great at managing schedules, you know, but you don't know because you just do it naturally. You might be an amazing cook, yeah. right? And you should be sharing that gift, but you're just kind of like, eh, it's that's just food, right. you know? There's these things that we do really well that oftentimes we haven't acknowledged. So what I would encourage you to do is ask the people around you. If you don't know what those things are, ask the people around you. Ask maybe your three closest friends, three family members. What are three things that you think I'm really good at? What are three things that uh, you think I have value, I I bring value to your life or to the world in? Right? Do that. Get some outside perspective. And I promise you, you're probably going to get some amazing feedback and kind of help you to point you in the right direction of where you might want to, you know, do a little bit more work. So know your worth. Yes. The the last thing I want to share is this quote. This is from Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and this says, working hard is important, but there's something that matters even more. Believing in yourself. Yes. All right. So today it's about taking back control of your life. Mm hmm. And stepping into that starring role in your own movie, because this is your movie. That's right. I'm honored to be able to play a character in your movie. And I'm Ma- honored to be able to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm like showed up like uh, Obi-Wan <laughs> right. or whatever you're into. I don't know what the Star Trek version like will be. Like Musafa, remember who you are. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so Lion King. I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of your story. But this is your story and it's your opportunity to do something amazing with it. There are no limits except the ones that you are carrying around in your mind. You know, I don't care how young you are or how old you are, what conditions you've come from, what conditions you're in now, there is a way. And it's just about using these four steps today to take action to move yourself beyond them. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you so much for joining us. This is episode 100. 100. This is a big deal, guys. Celebration. (laughs) So everybody take care. (laughs) Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.